You ready? Yeah. So, briefly, I just want to thank everybody for coming out today um, to this forum on solitary confinement and death by incarceration, which in Pennsylvania is called life without parole, but we call it death by incarceration because that's what it is in the sense where you're going to die in prison. Um, Guy in the campus is going to come up here and talk to you a little bit about more about the connection between the two issues and why we are connecting them. Um, in a nutshell, though, that um, you know, one of, one of the issues for us is that we see this as an issue of human beings being treated as, treated as disposable. So when you sentence someone to spend the rest of their life in prison, you're basically, with no chance of redemption, you're basically saying that person is disposable. And then when they're in prison and you put them in a hole for weeks, months, and in many cases years, you're saying that person is, that person is disposable. So for us, these two issues are connected. There's a relationship between them. And we believe that you can't attack one without attacking the other. And you know, there's plenty more attack points within the system, but for right now, these are the two that we're focusing on. And so thank you for coming out to you know, learn more about this issue. And we hope that many of you are, who are coming out will become advocates for this issue. Good evening. I usually am often inspired to begin any talk, especially in a group setting, with a quote by Vincent Harden, uh, the late educator and activist and contemporary of Martin Luther King. He said that the entire course of humankind leads to right here and right now, wherever we find ourselves. And from right here and now, not constrained or determined by the past, but motivated by the past, we are obligated to imagine a future that can restore the innocence of the first day. Innocence is something that had became very important to me, very, because it was something that I had lost very early in my life. Um, running away from home at the age of 15, about a week before I completed the ninth grade from Brooklyn, New York, hundreds of miles away to Philadelphia, where I got involved with some unsavory uh, characters and engaged in unsavory acts. And four months later, an explosive act of violence took place that amounted or resulted in the loss of a human life that I was directly responsible for. I was sentenced uh, to mandatory life without parole as a result. And for the next 30 years, I spent myself in prison for the next 30, 30 years with, with blood on my hands that all that time in prison could never wash off and no amount of good that I have done or ever will do will ever be able to wash off, right? And so I am here 17 months released after 30 years of incarceration. And I, I would want you to know that I appreciate being here and I know that you're not you know, hosting the likes of me and Celine and Carrington Keys in support of what we've done right? But it's because we believe in possibilities, we believe in hope, that there is a capacity for human transformation even after we have committed the ultimate trespass. There is maybe a higher level for our species to get to. There may be other ways that our society can deal and address violence and victimization in our communities in a way that really, really solves it. We know that coming from the city of Philadelphia where we come from last year, the year ended with about 1,403 shootings, 351 murders. Already this year, there's been about 570 plus shootings. We've had, just in the last few weeks, so much bloodshed that the blood is flowing through the streets of Philadelphia like a river. Many of it is our young people, family members, community members who want nothing but to live in safe and healthy communities and be able to raise their children to their maximum potential and full human development, right? 
And I bring these statistics up because at the same time, we're told that the way to deal with these problems is more police, more prisons, harsher sentences. And that's what we've been getting in the state of Pennsylvania, especially in the city of Philadelphia. But as you see, the violence keeps going up and up and up and up. So the way we've been dealing with things has not been reducing violence or ending violence and hasn't been doing anything to help families and communities to heal from the traumas of violence, right? We say we need another, another way forward. And we're only limited by our imaginations and what we can come up with, right? The kind of society that we want to create, the kind of system of justice that's going to get us there, right? It's a story that I read one time that resonates with me so profoundly. It, was a, it said that there was a mouse one time looking through the crack of a door, right? And saw the farmer and his wife opening a package. The mouse wondered what kind of food did this package contain in? He was devastated to discover that it was a mouse trap. So he, he scurried out to the farmyard, proclaiming the, the warning. There's a mouse trap in the house. There's a mouse trap in the house. The chicken, you know, her head down, clucking and, you know, picking and eating, raised her head up and said, I see this of great concern to you, Mr. Mouse but it's of no consequence to me, I can't be bothered with it. The mouse went on to the pig and said, Mr. Pig, there's a mouse trap in the house, there's a mouse trap in the house. The pig sympathized with the mouse and said, I'm so sorry, uh, Mr. Mouse, I see this is of great concern to you, but all I can do is pray for you, so be assured you're in my prayers. The mouse went on to the cow, there's a mouse trap in the house, there's a mouse trap in, in the house. The cow said, wow, Mr. Mouse, I'm really sorry, but it's no skin off my nose. The mouse returned to the farmer's house, head down, totally de dejected, to face the farmer's mouse trap alone. Later on that very same night, a sound was heard throughout the house, like the sound of a mouse trap catching its prey. The farmer's wife watched, rushed out, but in the darkness, she didn't see that a venomous snake, its tail was caught in the mouse trap. So when she went to, to remove or, or investigate what was in the trap, she was bitten. The farmer rushed his wife to the hospital and she returned to the house sometime after with a, a serious fever. Now everyone knows that to treat a fever you need chicken soup, so the farmer grabbed his hatchet and ran out to the farmyard for the ingredient. <laughs> but she didn't get better. Her, her sickness continued. The farmer's wife, was, it got worse. So friends and neighbors from all over came to take care of her and spend time with her. And the farmer needed to feed them. So he went out and killed the pig to feed her, to feed her friends and neighbors. Eventually she died. She succumbed to the venom and she died. And at the funeral, he had to kill the cow so that the people could have enough meat to eat. So the, the mouse watched from that same hole in the wall with great sadness at this. You know, whenever with someone of us is threatened, when one of us is threatened, we are all threatened. Kind of like when Martin Luther King said an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, or an injustice to anyone is a threat to justice for everyone, right? So we must encourage each other and stand by each other because each one of us is a vital thread in the tapestry of life. I say all this to say when we hear things like about solitary confinement and, and, and death by incarceration, oftentimes, we can distance ourselves from it by saying, well, this is what that person deserves, or they deserve what they're getting, and, or, whether, or, or we might even say this person deserves to be out here, they've done a lot of good in prison, and so on and so forth. And when we, when we talk in terms of what an individual deserves like that, 
or what a group of people deserves, I think we missed the mark. It's, it's not just about what the people behind the walls deserve, it's what we as a community deserve, what we as a society deserve, what kind of justice system do we deserve to identify with? What kind of system do we want to live alongside of? Right? With 2.3 to 2.7 million people incarcerated, more than anywhere else in the world, if mass incarceration and harsh sentences and solitary confinement is the way to solve and reduce violence, then America should be the least violent country in the world because no one incarcerates more than this country. Right? Monuments of misery known as prison have popped up all over this landscape like the measles. And we live alongside it. Right? What do we tell ourselves as a society and as individuals to make peace with that? And do we think we can do that and live alongside these things and make peace with it and tell ourselves whatever we rationalize ourselves and think we don't lose something of our own humanity in the process? Right? And so this is a conversation that we want to have today when we talk about solitary confinement and we talk about mass incarceration. It's not about what's happening to the people behind the walls. We want to have it from the perspective of like what Fyodor Dostoevsky said many, many decades ago when he said the degree of civilization in a society can be measured by entering its prisons, right? I was put in prison at the age of 15. I spent many years in solitary confinement. And it's by grace that I'm here standing before you right now, and it's an honor to be standing before you. And I stand before you as a continuation of my personal conviction to a life of sacrifice and service, right? But no amount of good that I do or ever or have done or ever will do will be able to offset the damage that I've caused. I've, I, there's no way I could bring to the table anywhere near what I took from the table. I recognize that, right? But I do know and I do believe that with what we face, with everything we face, not just solitary confinement and death by incarceration, but the, con the condemnation, the issue of condemnation, right? The culture of condemnation, how we condemn, how we condemn people to die in prison, how we condemn people to die on, on our borders, how we condemn immigrants, how we condemn women, how we and just, 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 our, just our capacity and our instinct to just judge and condemn is something that has been problematic for us as a species and it will only get worse. We've condemned our whole planet to quite possibly the sixth mass extinction. You know what I'm saying? And that's a whole nother conversation. But we have to have, with all that we're facing, y'all, all hands has to be on deck. There's no way we're going to be able to turn this ship around from going over a waterfall than if everyone grabs an oar. Mm -hmm. Everyone has to grab an oar, and that includes the people behind the walls as well, right? Because it's about accountability, and there is no healing without accountability. And accountability is not just sitting in a cell, rotting away in solitary confinement or death by incarceration, generating money for corporations and industries. Accountability is those who have caused harm, and have, and have taken human lives, have robbed, have caused pain and loss, our hands has to be directly involved in the healing process as well, in the process of healing justice over hanging justice. All right? And so it's good to have you all here. We have some stories that we want to hear, right? Because it's not about statistics. It's about these real lived experiences, the real pains and the real losses that families are going through. Right, that individuals are going through. And so without further ado, I don't know who's next. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So, so you know Thank you for your time. Circumstances yeah. like these, we just have constituencies that come up. Um, we have a lady here who has a son who is serving life without parole, plus forty years. She's also going through radiation treatment. She came out here for a boy. She asked, can she speak? You know, um, for me, you know, when I was, you know, I served 27 years in prison. My mother died of cancer while I was inside from lung cancer. So I can't tell her that she can't come up here and speak for her son. And also, 
we're here fighting for her son. So um, we're going to give her five minutes. She promised me that she only word, do five man. minutes. <laughs> you got my whole so, word. I'm tired. You know, uh, come on up. You know, okay, thank and, you. you know, this is this is a. Uh, you know, Marcel told me I had 30 minutes in his office. I got you. Okay. Excuse okay. me. My name is Regina Mason, and I'm originally from the Bronx, New York. My, I moved up to the Poconos to give my son a better life, my sons. And one of my sons were with the wrong people at the wrong time in the wrong place. I'm not going to tell you he was innocent, but we tried that he was going to Penn State on a roll student, charged in fatal shooting. He wanted to go to a college in Florida. So somebody called him up and told him they could get some guns and sell them so he thought he could go to Florida. So he's not totally innocent, but he's been there since two days before he turned 18, okay? Here I have another paper from the police where the girl has the gun pot on both of her hands while her father laid there bleeding. She locked the door and washed her hands. This is injustice, okay? This is my child. All right? Okay, 10 years is enough. He shouldn't have been there. And I don't condone it, but I was the first black woman in the Poconos to pick at the courthouse. They destroyed my life. Do you hear what I'm saying? I went to jail for five to 10 years because somebody said, my son's girlfriend said I tried to run her over. So that's when they wanted to send me to Philly, but I chose Harrisburg. I'm friends with Senator Greenleaf that retired I'm friends with the mayor, Linda Thompson, Mayor Pufus. I'm in his inauguration. You know, I am here to make a statement. If I have to stand on the Capitol steps by myself, I will do so. Because I have a date and a time whenever I'm ready. But I want to let y'all know this is ridiculous. And like I told Mayor Pufus, if you're going to keep these young boys in there that didn't even really kill nobody, send them to the war. Send them to Iraq. Let them do something then, or serve our country or something. Don't just let them ride away. And that's all I have to say. Y'all have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. I was five minutes, wasn't I? <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to apologize. No, no, no. <laughs> and I love all of y'all here, and God bless all your children, but we need to get on them steps, and we need to rally for this. I already talked to me a few views and he thought it was a good idea, so let's go. But I'm getting radiation and I'm I'm tired. I just got radiated just now. Okay? And this is my second treatment. So I'm a little tired, I got a headache, I had to have a beer, I think I'm a dying child. I'm going through treatment. Y'all have a good day. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry I have to leave, but I am behind you went at the percent, but y'all gonna see me before you see anything. Trust me if I don't die, man. God bless you, sister. And tell the lady I said thank you, thank you. God bless. Well, she's right, we do need to get busy. Um, I want to thank you all for, for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Sandy Strauss. I work for the Pennsylvania Council of Churches, and I um, am the Advocate and Outreach Director for the Council. Uh, we've been working on criminal justice reform issues now for a number of years. Uh, I want to share a little bit of the reasons why we do what we do. Uh, and first is we believe that all who are accused of crimes need to be afforded fair trials regardless of the race, ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic status, any of those things. And there needs to be alternatives to incarceration where appropriate. Um, we believe there's no room for vengeance or retribution in our criminal justice system because we believe that every soul is redeemable. And we believe that rehabilitation and restoration should be the first priority for dealing with persons who've broken the law. We believe that punishment should be proportionate to the crimes committed and uh, equal or similar regardless of the um, person that's convicted for the crime. In other words, they should not be racially biased or biased for any reason. And finally, we believe that we need to provide formerly incarcerated persons and their families with the supports they need to be uh, reintegrated into society once they've served their time. Now, 
I, I can speak only uh, on, from a Christian perspective, but as Christians, we know that Jesus spoke against hatred and spoke for love at every turn. Um, so imposing cruel or unusual punishment, whether it's solitary confinement, whether it's a death penalty, whatever it happens to be, um, is not an act of love. Uh, we're called to love our neighbors, and we're even called to love our enemies. Um, we're also called to treat others as we would wish to be treated. So that concept is known to most of us as the golden rule, and it applies to nearly every faith tradition, probably every faith tradition that exists anywhere. Um, sadly, we seldom see this concept applied when it comes to our criminal justice system. Uh, and that system, unfortunately, has been broken and has uh, functioned really badly for far too long, which is part of the reason we're here. We've seen a few promising signs in recent years, though. Last year, we were the first state in the nation to uh, pass what's known as clean slate legislation. And that's legislation that seals the records of those who've committed certain nonviolent crimes after they've kept a record clean for at least 10 years. Uh, we know that having a record is a barrier, can be a barrier to housing and employment. So this is a really important thing. 10 years is still too long, but at least it's a start. We're also seeing some bipartisan movement on abolishing Pennsylvania's death penalty. A lot of states have already done that. It's time for us to do that as well. And death penalty, we believe, uh, I have actually happen to serve on the board of uh, Pennsylvanians for alternatives to the death penalty as well. We believe it's cruel, it's expensive, and it doesn't serve as a deterrent to crime, which is what a lot of people say for the reasons we do that. Where we see less movement over the last few years is, is on the solitary confinement front and on life without parole. Now, we in the faith community have worked to uh, reduce or to end the use of solitary in our pres prisons here in Pennsylvania and around the country. Um, and our faith efforts here in Pennsylvania actually go back about 10 years. Um, it's our contention that solitary confinement is a form of torture because when it's used, especially in prolonged use, it can cause serious harm to the people who experience it. And there are some people who are kept in these conditions for not just days, but months, years, and in some cases even decades. And that's just wrong. Uh, medical experts have said that people who are kept in isolation like that for extended periods experience all kinds of really negative symptoms. And um, especially those who have mental health issues going in, and often those are the folks who end up going into solitary because their condition is not being treated appropriately, so they act out, they get thrown in, in the hole. So um, we, um, we need to find some more humane ways to deal with those um, people who are uh, in our prisons in the first place and something that, that really contributes more effectively to their rehabilitation and successful transition back into society. Now, when we started this, we started pushing for legislation. Um, we thought this would be the most effective way of ending solitary 10 years ago, but we quickly realized at that point that uh, it wasn't going to gain, it wasn't going to gain traction in, in the General Assembly. So we turned to putting some pressure on the Corrections Secretary, uh, John Wetzel, and we met with him in a series of meetings, and we visited several of the correctional facilities around Pennsylvania. And, and we talked to him about, you know, doing more administratively, which he says he's done. Now, we haven't really seen great evidence of that, unfortunately. Um, he's told us that the uh, use of solitary has been reduced, that there are limiting times that people can spend in solitary. Um, but knowing that even if, he, even if this is the case, unless it's in law, it can be changed. Uh, we know that. We talk about executive orders and things like that. Yes, it may be good temporarily, but we actually need legislation. Uh, so, 10 years down the road, here we are. There appears to be a little bit more appetite for this. We now have a bill, 
introduced by Representative Tina Davis. It's HB 497. And this would prohibit the use of solitary confinement for anyone who is considered particularly vulnerable. So that could be, that would be youth, seniors, LGBT persons, pregnant women, folks like that. No solitary. And then for anyone else, there would be a limit of 15 days that anyone could spend in solitary. And while our focus with the council has been primarily on solitary, uh, we do also support the end of uh, sentences of life without the possibility of parole. And, and this is what we have here in Pennsylvania right now, and you'll hear more about this tonight as well. SB 135, which was introduced by Senator Sharif Street, and HB 135 introduced by Representative Jason Dawkins would open the door to the possibility of parole for those who have served significant time and don't present any kind of safety risk to us. Um, we believe, as I said earlier, every soul is redeemable. We don't believe that uh, anyone should be forced to spend their entire life in prison, especially for mistakes that they need or that they committed when they were very young. We need to have a possibility of parole. So I hope that most of you have provided your name and contact information. There is a sign-up sheet back there. If you haven't, I'm going to ask that you sign in before you leave. Um, and that will make it possible for us to provide further resources and other information that you um, will ask you to act on <laughs> once this legislation starts moving. Right now it's not moving. But uh, I've also, I also have a petition back there that was put out by the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. There's a statement um, about ending solitary confinement everywhere. So if you want to sign that, that's there as well. And um, if you want to learn more, uh, we have stuff on our website at phearthisadvocacy.org, but if you are particularly interested in a faith perspective, you know, you can look at our site, or you can also look at the National Religious Campaign Against Torture's website, and that's um, www.nrcat.org. Uh, they have lots of stuff on there as well. So with that, thank you, and we have lots of folks who can talk to you now about what it really means to be serving uh, life without parole, serving time in solitary, and I think their stories are so much more important than anything I can say to you. So thank you for being here. So, our, yeah. And if you could introduce yourself as you, yeah, thank you. I will. <laughs> thank you very much for coming out. My name is Carrington Keyes. I'm formerly incarcerated. I spent 19 years in prison. Uh, 1,100 years was in solitary confinement. Um, I was part of a group of men known as the Dallas Six. It was six individuals who were serving time in solitary confinement at Dallas prison. And we participated in being inside whistleblowers and reporting out to the Human Rights Coalition what was going on within the prisons as far as brutality, uh, starvation of, uh, of prisoners, um, inmates' males being destroyed, um, yard deprivations, deprivation of exercise, uh, deprivation of showers. In, in a hole or solitary confinement, five days a, a week, you're given an uh, opportunity to shower and to uh, and exercise for one hour. You're locked in a cell 23 hours a day. So anytime out of the cell is um, it's like a pleasure. It's like appreciated to come out of the cell because you're locked in there looking at four walls all day. So, when you get deprived of one of these things, it's like a basic human need. You need some type of outside stimulation. So um, they look at us in there as being less than human beings. And it's like a thing in society in general that if a person committed crime or if a person is accused of a crime, that they deserve to be treated less than a human being. Now, <clears throat> as a result of my participation in this uh, Human Rights Coalition investigation and being a jailhouse lawyer and 
sending out complaints to different uh, branches of government, um, to the state police, district attorney's office, Department of Justice. I became a target along with the other men that was there with me. And uh, one day, one of the men, a little Puerto Rican kid known as Isaac Sanchez, he decided to stand up for his next door neighbor that was deprived of a meal tray by the prison guards. So when he spoke up, they decided to go in his cell with uh, what's called, they look like the SWAT team. They're called the Crisis Emergency Response Team. They come in your cell with Star Wars suits on, with shock shields and pepper spray and batons. And they went in there, roughed him up, and put him in a restraint chair. And he was sitting in a restraint chair all day and all night. And they're supposed to let you up from this restraint chair to exercise so that your circulation don't get cut off. Well, he ended up being in a restraint chair for 20 hours. So he called out to us because we could hear him in the other room that he was in. He said he couldn't breathe. And he said that his circulation was being cut off and his arms turned purple. So we decided to engage in a peaceful protest and we covered our cell doors with cloth. And this, in, in solitary confinement, this is one of the only ways that you can get attention to from a higher official from outside of the unit. Like, because the guards down there can pretty much do whatever they want without any type of supervision. So a group of us decided to cover up the door so that we can get somebody down there, a higher official. And once the higher official came down there, we got him out of the chair. But then they were still mad at us for the fact that we covered our cell doors up. But it was deeper than that. We also was um, reporting that they was coercing inmates to commit suicide, beating inmates up regularly, depriving people of basic human rights. So they decided, even after we took the cloth down, to come in our cells and do the same thing to us. So we decided to put up some, type, some form of resistance by um, closing off the cell doors with sheets to stop them from opening our doors up, but eventually they cut the sheets off with uh, bulk cutters or whatever and got, got in our cells, beat us up. They emergency transferred me to another prison and we continued to participate in exercising our rights to petition the government for redress of grievances by filing complaints and we would send out stuff to the Human Rights Coalition and to other organizations and they would have um, Senate hearings and they would put out, they put out a media release called Resistance and Retaliation and they got a lot of buzz, you know, on social media and it put, uh, they put the Department of Corrections in a bad light. So in return, they decided to go back to the incident that we covered our doors up and charge us with rioting. We didn't take any hostages, we didn't even come out of our cells, we didn't Blue, we didn't burn the jail down, we didn't do anything. We just covered our cell doors with a cloth, so they charged us with riot, and they charged me with assaulting seven officers. Keep in mind, these guys had Star Wars suits on. They was covered from head to toe with armor. There's no way that I could have assaulted any of them. So, to make a long story short, uh, it took seven years to, to fight these riot charges. It was a seven year trial. My mother ended up becoming an advocate. This is my mother right here, Chandra Delaney. She went around and she did exactly what that lady there, there just did. She picked it, she went to courthouses. She went, she came here to Harrisburg. She went, she even left the country and got support for us. So by, by that time, by her doing all that and getting the support, it, uh, we got international media attention involved so that they couldn't just do whatever they wanted to us. So when we first went to court though, I went to court, and they had helicopters there. They, they, they hired uh, 16 state troopers, 21 guards, extra police, and they had helicopters. They had helicopters follow the van to the jail. They said they got a letter that we was going to try to escape from the courthouse. We didn't even have the power to get out of ourselves. How are we going to escape from the courthouse? <laughs> so, so it was crazy. So they told me that that morning I had long dreadlocks. They told me to uh, mess up my hair. I didn't know why though. So when I got out of the van, they had all these media cameras there and they took the craziest picture of me. And they said, uh, 
riders, uh, they rioted and they assaulted guards when they came in their cells and it was just crazy. So when we went into the courthouse, there was only a judge in there. Usually when you go into a courtroom, there's a judge and there's a stenographer there to record what's going on. So I asked the judge, I said, who's recording this hearing? He said, according to the rules of the court, you're supposed to bring your own recorder. Well, I said, I'm in jail, I can't record this hearing. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm being denied due process. This is the kangaroo court. The only reason they gave us a new hearing is because the media was there at the courtroom and they reported. They said, Keith said that this is a kangaroo court. He's being denied due process because nobody's recording the hearing. So they gave us a whole new hearing. But the point I was making is that my mom had to go and get support for us in order for us to get a fair hearing. But we had to keep fighting and then eventually I represented myself and the other guys that was with me. One of them represented their, their self too. And we had another attorney from Philadelphia that was our co-counsel named Michael Wiseman. And we overcame the riot charges. And um, after that I sued the parole board. And the newspaper lied on me and still said that I got found guilty of assaulting the guard. So I had to sue them for defamation of character. <laughs> and I was, I was released after that, after I sued the parole board, and then they, they let me out. But I was in there for 19 years, 11 of those years, I was in solitary confinement. I seen people die. My friend, uh, John Carter, he was a juvenile lifer. He would probably be free right now if he wasn't, he, he wasn't killed by the hands of guards in solitary confinement. We pepper sprayed him until he suffocated. He had asthma. They weren't even supposed to even pepper spray this guy, all because he held a tray in his cell because his friend was deprived of food, so he held his food tray, so they went in there and made a fuss about a tray and killed this man. Um, there's a lot of things that gotta change. And um, I also wrote a book about the Dallas Six and about my case. It's, it's on Amazon and I got a few copies of it for a donation of $5. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank y'all for hearing my Thank you. Yeah. my relationship with my Uncle Craig is probably the most prominent illustration. My mother and my paternal grandparents raised me after my father left, and as you can imagine, when your father's parents remain in the same home as your mother after separation, you stop asking questions about traditional roles and learn to understand the true meaning of unconditional love. I am 28 years old now, so Craig entered prison about a decade before I was born. I believe Craig knew I needed consistency and support, and after my father left and looking back, I realized he offered that in every way he could. When I was a young child visiting him, he made sure I'd smile by playing fun more with me at every visit. He made sure I had a birthday card and holiday card in my mailbox every time I needed one. While I was in college, he sent me my, his favorite books so we could discuss them together. He wrote me letters to ask me about school, college, and my career to make sure that someone was paying attention. He gave me normalcy in the most unexpected ways. There is nothing scary or malice about Craig Datesman, a man serving a life sentence. He is my biggest fan, my pillar, and a man who stepped up when I needed a dad. I learned at a young age that our perceptions are not always steeped in reality and that often people like my Uncle Craig challenge the way that we view flaw the flawed and ever-changing world around us. Craig, though flawed in his actions from 37 years ago, has challenged me to view the world with a more loving and open lens, one that fosters understanding and beliefs in change. I'm here today to challenge you all to do the same. In June of 2018, Craig's case was heard by the Board of Pardons in the commutation process. Craig lined up all the right people, family, experts, a former lifer to attest his character. He was transferred to Camp Hill while waiting to be heard by the Board of Pardons. In that week's time of waiting, his mom, my grandmother, passed away. We had no way of telling him, or at least avoided finding him away, as to not distract him from his hearing. My heart broke as I spoke to, at his hearing, knowing that his, this broken system robbed him of his last goodbye with his mom, his true champion. 
And then we all sat and listened as he was denied computation. But we won't stop fighting. The honesty in his mistakes and the subsequent growth has helped me understand that sometimes our darkest moments can lead us to find the light. I truly believe this about Craig. His darkest moments have brought him to see some of his lightest days, and I believe this light should be shared. I'd like to help bring Craig home and allow my family and this world be re-inspired by the man Craig has become and the women and men like him. Thank you very much for listening. I did 11 years in prison. I was young during this time. So it was a lot of growing experience. So I spent all my young adult life in prison. So to come home to a new world, it felt like I came from a third world country. So it was a big experience and stuff like that. In prison, it's a lot of mental battles. It's not our battles that we have outside here in the real world where you're worried about bills and everyday living because life is so fast out here. Everybody's looking in their phones, so you have a lot of distractions. In jail, you don't have that many distractions. You have books and other things that you have. But it's more of a mental state because you're in there by yourself. You're not in there with your family. Some people may not get a call or even get visits or get mail. So all they have is the people around them, so they become your family. You interact with these people on a daily basis. You walk, you wake up to them like a foot from your bed. You can touch each other. So. In there, it's, it's that. So when people go from in jail to another jail within a jail, mm -hmm. it becomes more of a mental, even bigger mental battle in there as well. <clears throat> a lot of people struggle with mental illness in there and struggles because it's hard in there at times. You go through your ups and downs. And some people are not as mentally strong as some others to withstand it. A lot of people have suicidal thoughts, how they want to harm themselves. You see a lot of people do self-mutilation in there, cutting their legs or arms, hiding it, because you go to the hole, you're going to get in trouble. Because you're, when you cut yourself, you're considered state property, so you can get a misconduct for cutting yourself, even though it's your own body, because you're their property. You know, prisons are human mills. <laughs> They're making money off of it. And then they don't have really anything in there to help people deal with their issues. Dealing with the issue is to medicate people, because then you're less of a problem. You, I don't have to deal with you. You know, you're quiet, so we're just here to get you through this time and get you out this door. And if you ain't going nowhere, there's nothing to help you. <laughs> you better hope your neighbor is going to help you, and more likely they will, nine times out of ten. So within the prisons, we need more solutions and way to help people deal with their issues and problems. Medication isn't it. And sometimes even people that need the correct medications to help with their mental illness, Sometimes if it's not on that list of approved lists from the DOC, they're not going to get it. They're going to get substitute something else that is the same type of meds, but it doesn't work for them, but it is what the DOC approves. Even sometimes in within the medical field, in there, it's a battle because everything got to go through chain of commands, has to get approved, and you're lucky if it does get approved or even gets acknowledged. So... It's always a battle within there, but out here it's even in a battle for people to acknowledge it because people don't look at faces with people within the prison. It's just their crime itself, and that's it. You're no longer human. You're a number. You're just there. You're a face to somebody that loves you or a face to people that come to take a stand against the injustice of society. Well, not society. It's the wrong word, so just bear with me, okay? But the injustice within the systems and stuff like that. Yeah. So, even farms, um, I can't say it right now. Someone help me. Pharmaceutical companies, they make a lot of money off of prisons, too. Because I'm telling you, where I was at, it was at Cambridge Springs. So, they're probably like 97% of the women are on medications. Because you can't sleep. Some people say they can't sleep, and it's easier that way for institutions and the employees to deal with people on a day to day basis. Um, and a lot of staffing is not trained properly. And I'm not going to say all guards are in there are ignorant or mean, because you did have there's some decent ones that really wanted to do more, but they were limited to what they could do because 
it's all the chain command, and, that's, and then you have your other guards that aren't. So it's not really about balance, and there's nothing in there to help people to be rehabilitated. I mean, when I'm coming to the society, you protect your sit um, productive citizens out here, but if you're not giving the stuff within the prison to help people do better, to come out here, be more prepared, then I don't know how you expect that. I just think there just needs to be more solutions even within the prisons and like you said, communities as well to help prevent these issues from continuing. And if there's no solution, you can't expect a better result. I'm done. Thank you. So hey, I'm John from CADV and organizing with the Abolitionist Law Center. Um, so we just heard some stories from different folks uh, bringing us the reality of the situation that's inside of the Pennsylvania State Prisons right now. Um, we don't want this event to just be a passive thing where you're just sitting here hearing these stories. Um, so now we want to take a few minutes, uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes, to get together in groups with about four or five people around you um, and to do two things. So first is to say how this issue is something, either of those issues is something that directly affects you, right? So you might not think right away if you're somebody that doesn't have a loved one in prison or haven't been in prison yourself, that this is something that directly affects you in some way or other. Um, but as we've heard from a couple people kind of planting those seeds, this is something that we as a community, as a state, as a society, have decided is the way we're gonna do criminal justice and is the way that we're gonna try to deal with conflicts that arise, right? So just as baseline members of the community, we're all somebody that is uh, not just involved with that, but we're the people that are saying we're okay with that. That is what we're condoning. Um, but I think there's a lot of other things you can try to think. We just heard people being very honest about their own situations. Um, to try to think, you know, what ways, even if it is indirect, what are some ways where you feel like this is something that you're a part of, something that affects you? Um, so that's the first thing. Everybody can just kind of maybe go around in a circle and say that, uh, share it with people that are in the group with you. And the other thing then is to think, what can you do? Um, and this isn't just, you know, how can you go talk to a senator? How can you go talk to the people that have power? Uh, but think creatively. You know, what can you do? What do you have at your disposal? What do you have as a community member? Um, what do you have in terms of talents and other things? that you could be contributing to this because I think a lot of the people who have been in this room uh, who have been fighting this stuff for a long time knows it takes every little bit of ingenuity, every little bit of talent uh, you know, to be fighting this thing on all levels and at every moment of the day. Um, so we just want to take some time to make sure that everybody's had the chance to, to really sit and think through that. Um, and at the end of that, uh, maybe we can all report back some of the stuff that we shared and were able to think of as things that we can do moving forward to try to resist some of these policies, think of better ways to do things, um, and to make sure that people don't have to go what Sunshine go, has gone through, don't have to deal with what Brianna and family have had to go through, don't have to deal with any of the nightmare that Carrington and family had to go through, um, and didn't have to do any of the stuff that Ghani and Celine have gone through as well, um, and that we can think of ways that just create a system in which we are dealing with conflict, we are dealing with harm, uh, in ways that just don't keep, keep those cycles going on and on. Does that sound good? Yes. Um, yeah. So I do have one, one option left though. So a lot of people here came together, you came in groups and stuff. <coughs> Normally my instinct would be to say to break that up so that you all can meet some new people, but I don't want to be telling you what to do. So what sounds better? Should we count off and kind of go into groups? of four or five based on that, or do you feel more comfortable just sitting around in the groups around geographically close to you? Count off. We got one vote for counting off. Okay. Two votes for counting off. Anybody feel strongly opposed to counting off? Counting off it is, all right. Uh, so there's two, four, six, eight, seven, 12, 13, 16, 18, 20, about 25 of us here. So maybe we can do five groups of five? Yeah. Um, from Chef, Chef Lizard, okay. and I'm not really driving in the dark. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, so we don't know if that excuse is for real or somebody just trying to get out. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, 
Let's still keep it about the same. We can count off uh, one through five. Got it? You want to start us off? One, two, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One. Three. Alright, so we can just do ones over here, twos over there, threes there, fours there, fives there. solitary, uh, the trauma related um, from, from these experiences, uh, or even like somebody mentioned it was worse than during four military combat uh, tours. And uh, also, uh, I guess it's like PTSD or post-traumatic stress. Um, because when you're in programs and you're working in groups, sometimes something can trigger you and you just can't come back. And that's a sad story. And, um, but all around the state, we realize that uh, there's a lot of things that we can do. Um, it's being very active, being very vocal, get political. Um, there's a lot of good things happening in the Philadelphia area where... Uh, <laughs> Um, it was, we were talking about the mail and the books in prison and how the vocal people were there and they took advantage of both being wanting to be reelected and different things that you can do and 500 people or groups were there and uh, really spoke out against uh, some of the things that were happening. That were, and another way that we can get political is for people that don't necessarily are always in agreement is if when you mention the cost of things and the cost of prison and what that involves uh, financially, unfortunately. It would be best if we talked about the personal harm, but financially that seems to make an impact on people that might not always choose to agree with each other. Anything else, guys? Okay. Oh, we also talked about the importance of getting mail in prison, communicating. That's it. My PS. Um, so we had, um, I think, everybody in our group was um, throughout the course of their lives has been touched deeply by somebody who, um, multiple people who have been incarcerated and in that way have been impacted by the system. So we had three people who um, spent a lot of time incarcerated, and other another person with family members incarcerated, and we've all really been um, had people felt the gifts of the many the the many gifts that people incarcerated people and all people have to offer. Um, so and. It's a representation that this problem has become so massive that everybody is impacted nearly directly because it's just so all-encompassing. Um, and through our interactions with these um, great people who are incarcerated, we have um, felt uh, 
compelled and um, just completely, sometimes completely driven to help others and to try and reduce this, um, the, the great harm that has been, um, that people have uh, incurred and that continue, people continue to feel from this uh, great injustice. Um, so what we can do, um, one thing that we can do is start um, providing care and services to young people before they reach the point where incarceration is becomes like uh, such an inevitable um, and predetermined fate for them. So that's um, community um, organizations and opportunities and um, opportunities for people to um, have enjoyment. And um, to do that instead of just continuing to ramp up the um, violence in, um, that we see in police officers and in the furthered um, sort of militarization of um, these systems of uh, violence and control in our neighborhoods. And that starts in the communities on, the, on a small level and it starts in our homes. Um, so yeah, it's preventative and proactive measures um, to deal with these issues that that when we don't deal with them are just solved by incarceration and that sort of violence and pain. Um, really providing a voice for the voiceless um, and giving people that are incarcerated and are um, marginalized and just not given um, a voice to share their stories or to share what they think about issues um, and to really have input and um, control over the solutions that we come up with for these things. So we can do that by continuing to do things like this where we give spaces and um, energy and reception to people to share their story and to continue to um, work through um, the harm and um, pain. Um, and through that, people can become more confident and um, become better able to um, deal with the issues that um, and the harm and the pain. So, um, and to avoid uh, other situations like Khalif Browder, um, who ended up killing himself after mm -hmm. being so um, just harmed, abused, abused yeah. tortured. And um, Joe Legion, who um, has now spent 66 years, starting in 1953, in prison, and at this point is just incapable, really, of um, rejoining society, and has now is now just sort of resigned to this um, shell of um, a life because that's just what sort of all that's left. Um, so and. Some of these services um, inside, outside, before, um, proactive, to focus on mental health and um, the extreme amounts of mental health that we have on our, um, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our streets, and in our prisons. And when that is not dealt with proactively and with compassion and with um, humanity, that's when um, how we arrive at this. So creating places and um, services for these people to really be treated well and um, get the care that they need rather than making things worse in the prison. Um, we need more women and um, trans and people who have just been um, so marginalized and um, oppressed and are often the most uh, victimized and harmed and um, abused by this system. So by continuing to empower and extend our humanity to them, um, appreciating people, and um, by um, bringing in uh, restorative justice to bring part, bring uh, parties from both um, the victims and the um, people who committed the harm, and to come up with real ways for people to take accountability and to make some sort of um, steps to make amends and um, reduce the harm. So there's an awesome book that came out recently called Until We Reckon by Danielle Surad. Um, and she
she has um, in Brooklyn um, by doing by bringing these parties together, um, really reducing recidivism and creating ways for people to heal and to move past um, our, some of their some of their mistakes. Okay, um, as far as being impacted, um, we're, we were either, in this group, we were either impacted by, um, by a family member or either by us being someone who does the work, working with prisoners. Um, and I guess as part of doing the work, we were talking about how we, I guess, feel, and we were saying that, um, that we, some of us feel isolated in doing the work. Um, and that we need to, we need to, we need to try to work together and we need to, um, we need to, we need to um, do more networking and, um, and like within our group, we, we um, said that we would help each other and we would support each other's, you know, um, efforts of whatever, whatever they're doing. Uh, oh, we also talked about um, having a voice. Like, like the um, lady came in, you know, and, you know, and she took command and she let us know, you know, what her issue was. So we talked about that, like having a voice and actually using, using that voice to, to fight. Uh, we were also talking about, um, about the health issues in the, in the prisons and how possibly if they, if they just, started off at least number one with a healthy diet. Like mm -hmm. that might, mm -hmm. you know, help a little bit. And then is there other stuff? I was gonna say, yeah, the, the, the diet and everything, that would definitely help. Because there's unfortunately a lot of issues where they um, just prescribe, you know, just prescribe for nothing instead of changing the diet, which would actually could help in any situation with a lot of people when they come out. But also, um, about um, trying to connect and help other people be able to understand, like friends and family, that they can fight for other people for um, you know things that they're dealing with inside um, that that is not right. Um, there's unfortunately a lot of people that uh, don't realize that they can fight um, that they shouldn't be treated the way that they are, or they should be able to you know, be a voice also for the in inside. representing a group that's called Friends Over Fences, and it's a prison ministry. Uh, we meet um, Wednesday nights, every Wednesday night, 6 o'clock, at the Grantham Brethren in Christ Church, and that's in Mechanicsburg. If you go on Facebook and just, you know, look up Friends Over Fences, uh, they have a Facebook page, and it would give you some information. But basically, one of the some of the things that we try to do um, is any of those that uh, ex-offenders, once they get released, uh, we do help to try to uh, find them housing and jobs. And uh, we even have, there's a, a, a room in the church that's called Jewel's Closet, and, it, and it, we just give away all kinds of clothes and um, household supplies and that kind of thing, just to get people set up um, and uh, to try to to help them whatever, any way they can. And we also promote trying to um, write to prisoners uh, across the state of Pennsylvania. We really, um, we get all kinds of, we put out flyers or, um, and, or they'll send any prisoner that wants uh, um, a pen pal, they, you know, we try to find out who they are and then we have people in the different, in the churches that will, will help to do that. Um, now the next, one other thing that I would like to invite you all to is on July uh, the 10th, we're having Brandon Flood there uh, speak. And so if 
any of us know him, he uh, was just appointed as the Secretary of the Board of Pardons in the state of Pennsylvania. And he has been previously incarcerated. So he has a, a unique perspective to it all. And so it would be just great to see you know, you all there and just, you know, giving a voice there. Um, you can find that information. Friends of Offenses. Yes, July Friends of 10th. July 10th. Brandon Flood. Yes, and okay. it should be on, I think it's on the, the Facebook page. Okay. On, um, All right. Thank if you. you Google that, so uh, thank you. Um, go to the next one. Know that we were just as, as uh, focused as the rest of you. It seems like we uh, wandered around a fair bit. We cheated on I know that. <laughs> <laughs> but we uh, have had someone has, has been incarcerated. The rest of us mainly have been aware of people returning or through 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 um, uh, through work uh, been involved with him. and um, I know personally just I'm amazed at how many people have been incarcerated in my neighborhood and um, and are, are returning, thank goodness, but it's just too many um, that are, that we're putting away. Um, but the things that we thought were useful were visiting and uh, sending money and um, writing. And uh, some of us are in the prison society, um, kind of watching what's happening at the prison, and watching uh, legislation. Thank you. Yeah. What else? I got short-term memory, too, for shout out taking fun of stuff. I got mine by, by just aging <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I'll, I'll speak for us. My name is Rhonda Cherry, and two out of the four of us um, have been incarcerated, and we have one who was advocating for her uncle. We discussed um, certain things about being forgotten. She didn't uh, want her uncle to be forgotten. Um, he's been away so many years, so she felt as though that when you talk about the individual and you bring that individual um, to the attention of others, it brings a sort of warmth and love that, you know, because they would care about her, then they would care about her uncle and what she's going through and how she's feeling about the person that has, I don't want to say cast aside, but... A lot of times you can go to jail and you can be forgotten. When you first get there, the letters are coming, the visits are coming, people are accepting your phone calls. But after you stayed some considerable amount of times, phone calls, nobody home, it's Friday night, they're not there. Um, letters are taking longer to return when you write them, things like that. So she didn't want her uncle to be forgotten. So that was her way of keeping, you know, um, his incarceration and what's happening to incarcerated individuals to the forefront. Your name again, I'm sorry. Ellen. Ellen wanted to bring awareness about Dolphin County and the things that they go through as far as the food that's prepared for them and how the times that they're eating. And everyone's not fortunate to have money. So if they're feeding them breakfast at 3.35, 30 in the morning, you're getting lunch like 11 and then dinner's at 4. If you don't have any money, so from 4 to like 5.30 the next morning, that's almost 12, 13, 14 hours that you're hungry. The portions aren't 
enough where you can go back and get seconds or you can be forced just enough to sustain you. Her concern was the violence that her um, son has, has been enduring, not only from different inmates, but from the guards as well. So maybe the guards need a different sensitivity training. Do not assume what you hear this person may be infamous for a certain crime or anything so you feel like that you can treat, mistreat them when you get there. Um, for me, um, working with uh, the Dignity Act uh, for incarcerated women, my cause is to fight for um, women when we get arrested. Just like when anyone's arrested, they're arrested with what they have on their back. So if I, if I go there and they don't have hygiene products for me, they don't have um, panties for me to change and God forbid women get their monthly cycle, they don't have the, the, the products to give you. So say you don't have money, so then what do you do? If you do have money, commissary is still once a week. So by the time you order it and it comes the following week, that, that that's inhumane. We talk about the trauma of women being, um, I was in labor. I was shackled around my waist, I was shackled around my feet, and I was taken to the hospital. When I got there, I was shackled to the bed. The only reason why I wasn't shackled actually when I had my daughter is because when the the shift changed. I had been in jail for 19 months waiting to go to trial, and I didn't cause any trouble. The guards knew me. The second shift came in, so they allowed me, you know, to not be handcuffed to the bed and things like that. But there are other women who aren't as fortunate. And it's not that we don't care, we don't fight for the men. We don't know the, the hardships that the men go through. We have men that, that do like, like these gentlemen here. They can fight for the men. They can speak for you know, what the men go through. So we as women, we want to fight um, for the incarcerated women. So we need to talk to um, our city council, our state um, representative. We need to get them involved. It was a town hall meeting last week in Philadelphia. Um, unfortunately, I had to miss it. I was working. But things like that will keep all of this in the forefront mm -hmm. for those who have been incarcerated. If you haven't been incarcerated and you've been affected by someone who has been incarcerated, it's still trauma. We come home, I just lost a job that one of my dream jobs because of something that I did 30 years ago. And since then they don't care what you've done. I've, I've, I've come home, I went to school, I got a degree, all that. They don't care. They don't care. So what do we do? How long do we continue to pay for crimes? These are the things that we need to fight for in legislation. And legislation, once my time is done, why am I still paying for it 10, 20, 30 years later? And these are the things that we need to fight for because it doesn't stop once you're released. It doesn't stop there. So those are the things that we want to take. Um, keep our family members' memories alive to fight for them. Hopefully, you know, her uncle will be one of the gentlemen that, you know, will be blessed to come home. Um, her son, hopefully we can get training so people won't be, at the guards especially, won't be so aggressive when they're there. Learn how to deal with someone. Just because I'm having a, 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 a moment does not deserve, like the gentleman, he died. Because I, I was having a moment because I'm going through a moment. Have some sensitivity training. A whole, there's a whole plethora of things that we need to do and I think it starts with us going to our city council making them listen go to state legislating them come here to Harrisburg protest and let our voices be heard that we would ask is that everyone just take these experiences, process them, and you know, listen to, like you said, you know, go back, talk to your legislators, talk to your community, because a lot of times we get caught up in like speaking to those who we perceive to be in power, but we have to remember we put those legislators in power, so it's very important to organize and speak out and mobilize in your community to put pressure on these legislators. That's very important. That's one of the main things that we really emphasize within CAVI, within the Human Rights Coalition, and within our campaigns is when we go see legislators, we're not going there begging, we're going there demanding. These are, these are fundamental human rights that we're talking about. But on the opposite end of that, if we don't have the community behind us, they can ignore us. And it's very important that we mobilize and organize within our community. So that's something that we would ask you to take away. Um, Jillian, you got one question? Sorry, yeah, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Jillian, um, I'm a journalist, I work with 
Penn Live on the Patriot News. I'm actually an intern. Um, but I'm working on a project about um, solitary confinement in Pennsylvania, about the bill um, that you guys have been talking about. So I just wanted to introduce myself and if anybody has a story or uh, has been affected by it and would be interested at some point down the road in speaking with me, I have paper and pen. You write down your name. Do they give you a business card yet? I don't have a business card. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have a pen. Oh, that's the personal ones. Oh, wait, you're an intern, so we understand. Yeah, <laughs> I've, only, I've only been here for a few days. <laughs> yeah. All right, so if anyone wants to share their story, this is this is what we're here for. Folks here who have a story to tell us, a loved one in prison, this is what we're here for, for you to have a voice. So afterwards, if you would like to talk to Jillian, not here, because she could arrange a call, a personal one-on-one call, one call, you know, exchange your numbers with her, because she could help get this message out to the community. Um, before we go, um, I'm going to let Gandhi close us out and sing or something because that's what he does. So, but I want to pass out these, these, these one more packet, which is just basically a how-to, a how you can support um, House Bill 497, which we're here to get passed. So I'm going to, if, if, if you could just take these out and pass them out on your road, that would be appreciated. And while this is going around, if, if you haven't signed in to the sheet, one of the sheets back here, it would be really great if you could do that. Um, and I'll, I'll follow up. I'm going to share this also with, um, with some of my other friends here so they have it. But um, I, I, you know, so we can send out additional information about what's happening. Uh, I would be very happy to share Jillian's information as well, if that's okay with you, and let folks contact you. Yeah. So um, that's, you know, th there's all kinds of things that are hopefully going to be coming down the pike now that the budget's just about out of the way. Um, we hope we can make this legislation move. I'm going to be... Um, working on getting some groups together to go do visits here in Harrisburg over the coming months. So any of you that are interested in, in doing that, going to visit legislators, I'd be happy to talk to you, and I'll include that in some follow-up as well. Okay, thank you, Sam. Sure. And before Gandhi closes it out, I just want everybody else to know that Cab Meets Harrisburg chapter meets here every third Saturday of the month at 1.30. So if you're interested in getting more involved, if you're from this area, from the region, every third Saturday, Saturday, 1.30 here, Gabby meets. It's Harrisburg chapter. So if you can make it, that would be great. Um, Today we talked about the two main issues we talked about was death by incarceration or life without parole and solitary confinement. Robert Blecker said, and I quote, the sentence of life without parole is a very strange sentence when you think about it. The punishment seems either too much or too little. If an extraordinarily cold, callous killer deserves to die, then why not kill him? But if we're going to keep the killer alive when we can otherwise execute him, then why strip him of all hope, end quote. Of course, Robert Blecker wasn't advocating that somebody be executed, but he was saying that it's something that's just as sadistic, if not more sadistic, mm -hmm. to deprive you know, human beings of any kind of hope as it is to just sentence them to, to the death penalty. And because that life, by, life without parole is the other death penalty, mm -hmm. this is why we call it death by incarceration, right? It does rob people of human dignity. It does negate the human capacity for transformation and redemption, right? To sentence someone to the rest, whether it's men, women, children, as this country has been known to do, for the rest of their natural life without even a process. For them to come before a board to determine if they've adjusted and to determine whether they should be released or not is to negate the human capacity for transformation, to say that someone has no redemptive qualities and no one but God can say that, right? 
and to deny a person an inalienable human right. On another side, Albert McCoy, in his book, The Question of Torture, CIA Interrogation from the Cold War to the War on Terror, spoke about solitary confinement. When we talk about torture today, we're not even talking necessarily about medieval tortures, although they still do that. We have waterboarding and, and, and things like that. But just putting someone in a cell without any windows or with soundproof windows where they can't even hear birds or trees or wind or the rain, total sensory deprivation, just that alone. They actually did a test that he, spoke, that he mentioned in the book where they took some college students and some professional people and put them in these, in these cells with central air, cold central air, and this in a matter of hours, their personalities started to erode, right? Some of them started slipping into, uh, into an autistic presence, right? And so, I mean, like, and, 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 and mind you, when we're talking about the war on terror, we're thinking about Abu Ghraib, and we're talking about, thinking about Guantanamo Bay, and we're thinking about black sites all around the world that has raised human rights issues. All of those prisons were modeled by solitary confinement right here in this country, beginning with Marion, Illinois, control you. Matter of fact, the, one of the persons that was running Abu Ghraib, Charles Grainer, was a guard from Greene County. So they took, I mean, who else to train other, you know, train other, these kind of, <laughs> train torture in other countries, but somebody who had mastered it, you know what I'm saying, where it was started at, you know, and so perhaps if we had stood up and took issue with solitary confinement the way we were supposed to, mm -hmm. we would have prevented human rights abuses spreading all around to other parts of the country in the form of these other prisons. But we have an opportunity now to change that by standing up now. Right? We could stand up now and speak out against those things now and stop those things now so that it doesn't continue to spread and it doesn't continue to get worse and human beings are not continuously indignified Right, and again, it's not just about what's happening to people over there or those people behind the walls. It's all of us, because they're us and we're them. Sure, they're taking people from a certain area and putting them in them prisons, right? But those prisons are built in rural communities too. So it's not even a thing about race, right? It's affecting everybody. The people in the prison might be predominantly people of color, but the prisons aren't built in places that are predominantly white. And those prisons are destroying the ecosystems and the communities in those areas. So we all have a stake in this, right? And we can't do it ourselves in Philadelphia or in Chester or Delaware. We need, y'all, we need everybody. You know, we especially need this community. We need the Quaker community to stand with us because we can't do it by ourselves, right? We can't do it by ourselves. And all of us have a role to play in this narrative. We all have a profound duty to discharge to the universe, to the community, to create a society and a world that's more conducive to our children growing up and reaching their maximum potential. Right? With that said, it's been an honor and a blessing to stand before you. Let's do it, y'all, because the only how we can do it is together. Like Martin Luther King said, it's in, we will have to repent in this generation, mm -hmm. not just for the hateful words of the bad people, but for, you, but for the appalling silence of the good people, all right? Yeah. So let's find our voices and let's speak up. Let's move these legislations. Let's hold these politicians accountable. Let's groom our own leaders, our own civil servants, and let's put them in office ourselves, all right? And let's change this system. And that because too much is at stake and time is not on our side. Thank you for your time.